Hello everyone and welcome back to another Sponge Chat. My name is Jim and it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you all. Um, you'll have to excuse the absence um, from the blog and from social media. I've just been at IHSL and it's kind of been the focus of my work and efforts for the last few weeks. Um, I'll have something coming out for IHSL quite shortly. Um, it was a crazy experience, um, but more on that in other post. Uh, this sponge chat's quite special, um, mainly because I, I spoke to Joe Dale, who's an educational technology specialist with an EOT. Um, and the reason I got Joe on uh, was he got in touch with me uh, back coming on, and I thought it'd be a perfect time because there's lots happening in our world, and a lot of it is focusing on technology, especially with things like chat GPT. Uh, now, I'm not doing a specific episode on ChatGPT, but within this sponge chat, we did speak about uh, the use of AI within language teaching. And it was really interesting to hear Joe's thoughts on kind of the state of technology within EOT, um, but also his perspective on trying to predict what's coming next, um, and perhaps the, the bad things about that. Um, and so yeah, I, I, won't, I won't give away too many spoilers, but we looked at that. We also looked at many other things, you have to excuse me, I have my notes here. Um, we spoke about kind of the aspects of, or the importance of digital literacy um, within our learners and perhaps our role as teachers, okay, and teacher educators as well, in, the, in terms of developing teacher literacy as well, um, with regard to digital resources, but looking at that, that element of working with learners and the importance of focusing on digital literacy at times. We looked at a various, uh, various sort of frameworks as well for evaluating how we're using technology and, 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 and many other things. Um, Joe gave us a few examples of, of digital tools that he likes as well, which was, which was really interesting. And of course, there were some recommendations uh, for reading as well. So make sure you check them out. Um, looking forward to hearing your thoughts about this bunch chat. And stay tuned because over the next few months, I have many, many more coming. Speak soon. Bye. Well, Joe, I just want to say um, a huge thank you to you for taking time out of your schedule to be here uh, with me today to, to talk about something that you're passionate about, educational technology. Absolutely. Well, it's lovely to be here. I love appearing on podcasts. When I saw your uh, your podcast come up on my radar, I thought, well, that's perfect. I'll have to, have to get in touch with uh, Jim and see if I can come on your podcast to talk about, as you say, uh, technology, languages, and um, and anything in between. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, well, I mean, for those that are, um, maybe this is the first time they've listened to a Sponge Chat. And uh, basically, Sponge Chats, they, they started, you know, uh, some, some time ago, basically looking at how I moved into teacher education. And they sort of, they've evolved now into what I call perspectives. And so we're looking at certain little um, experts within their field, within uh, language teaching, um, and they're giving their perspectives on on what it is that they're an expert in. And, uh, and yeah, I'm really happy to have you here speaking about something that that's that's probably, everyone's thinking about it at the, mo at the moment um, for, <laughs> you know, chat GPT, thinking about tech. And, 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 I, and I assume that we're going to talk about that later. But my first question is always kind of a big question. Um, and, it's, and it's, who is Joe? Well, that's a good question. And actually, talking of chat GPT, I decided to do a bit of a vanity search on chat GPT saying, <laughs> who is Joe Dale? So um, if I can read it out to you, if that's okay. So first of all, I said, Go I for it. with a prompt, um, of have you heard of Joe Dale? So ChatGPT's answer was there were several people named Joe Dale. So I would need to need to have more information to determine which one you're referring to. Could you please provide more context or details about who Joe Dale is? So I then put in my my next um, prompt, uh, which is all about um, it's all about iteration, isn't it? It's all about mm. um, putting your prompt in and then uh, based on the answer that you get, changing the prompt or or sometimes asking ChatGPT to create the prompt for you, which I found is really useful. So I literally just wrote technology and languages. And then ChatGPT said, ah, in that case, you might be referring to Joe Dell, an expert in the field of technology and languages. Joe Dell is a freelance consultant, trainer, and conference speaker who specializes in integrating technology into language teaching and learning. Joe Dell has been involved in the field of educational technology for over 20 years and has worked with various organizations and institutions to promote the use of technology and language teaching. 
He's also delivered talks and training sessions on topics such as podcasting, digital storytelling, and social media for language learning. If you have any specific questions or topics you would like me to ask Joe Dell about, I can certainly try to help. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I haven't actually done that. I, I, I've obviously been playing around with ChatGPT, uh, but I've never thought about... I mean, everyone does the Google search on themselves, right? You know, you, you you type your name into Google, but never thought about typing my name into ChatGPT. I'll have to see what it says. That's cool. very so interesting. Maybe if I could add to that a little bit more, you know, augment yeah, please. Um, ChatGPT has said. So my my background is I'm a former um, French teacher, former languages teacher. Um, I taught for 13 years, three years at secondary school level, and then 10 years at middle school level um, on the Isle of Wight, which is where I still live. And I've lived here for over 20 years. So when I was working in the middle school, that was for nine to 13 year olds. So I've got upper primary and secondary school experience. And for the last 13 years or so, I've been um, an independent languages consultant. And mm -hmm. before the pandemic and before Brexit, I would travel all over the world running training on, as uh, ChatGPT said, on um, how technology can enhance language learning, speaking at conferences here, there and everywhere. I've been to uh, Australia and New Zealand, for example. Uh, many times I've been to North America, all over Europe, uh, the Middle East, uh, South America, you know, you name it. Um, I've been to to most places. And then I've also worked with all the major uh, language associations around the world, um, uh, running training, as I've said. And uh, in addition to that, um, with a, like an ELT hat on, um, I've been regularly going to the IATEFL conference. The last time I went was in 2021 when there was the virtual version. Right. Uh, prior to that, I've been, uh, I went every year from 2013 onwards. And in fact, the original reason I went to um, IATEFL was because uh, Graham Stanley from uh, Mexico from the right. British Council had invited me to um, speak at the uh, PCE, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, pre-conference event. And I did an hour's talk, and at the end of that, I was uh, approached by a couple of people, one of whom invited me to go to Brazil, and one person invited me to go to Canada. So I thought, well, this is all right, isn't it? I, I like this it. is good. And um, <laughs> yeah, and that that's it. And I've been um, I've been sort of recognised as the the man behind the MFL Twitterati by the Guardian. Um, so if people don't know what that is, essentially, it's a community of language teachers, language consultants like myself, and language organisations. There's uh, um thousands of members of the of the mfl twitter art in the hashtag is used by people literally all over the world and has been for many many years and um i actually manage um a, a twitter list called mfl twitterers which has uh, nearly five thousand members and i put people onto that list and it means they get an, an immediate audience for anybody interested in languages and um mm. And pedagogy, it's not all about technology, but about pedagogy. And right. it doesn't matter if you're primary or secondary or tertiary education. Most people on there are secondary, but um, we have a whole mix of different people. And yep. also followed and connect with lots and lots of ELT people as well. People like Graham, I've mentioned, Russell Stannard, Nick Peachy. In fact, I've just started looking at um, the course which uh, Nick Peachy has put together about ChatGPT in the Languages Classroom, which is really cool. Yep. So I started doing that, uh, doing that yesterday. So that's a that's a potted history, but we can talk about you know whatever you would like um, in relation to the things which are, are to do with my my skill set, as it were. That's uh that's brilliant. There's a lot obviously compressed into a minute there. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting. You mentioned obviously Russell Stannard, Nick Pitcher. I had Nick on uh, oof, some time ago now. Um, very very interesting person, um, and. Uh, like you, very, very interested in, in educational technology and, and all sorts of things there. So uh, but going on to that, your interest in in ed tech and, and foreign languages, uh, where did that come from? Because, I mean, when, when people think about foreign languages and you know, something I learned from my, my chat with Nick, actually, like the, the idea of technology being involved in language teaching has been around for quite some time. Um, you know, look at the, the old Cal centers and things like that. But where, where did your interest in in the idea of ed tech and foreign languages come from okay so essentially um which is what i always say i was a, a languages teacher first and foremost who then developed an interest oh. in technology not the other way around and so um my sort of interest uh started around uh 2002 i think it was which is when i was able to um uh get a, a computer through the uh, the government subsidy of the um uh uh 
computers for teachers scheme back in the day when the government actually gave uh, schools a bit of funding, which was lovely to see. Um, <laughs> I was able to get a discount on a computer as long as it was one of the ones on the list, as it were, um, which I think was five hundred pounds, which is quite a lot of money at the time. So I, mm. I bought uh, my own computer, and then based on that and getting a, a dial-up connection. I was able to uh, work out uh, the basics of what I wanted to uh, be able to do. So I really, you know, it might sound surprising, but I could really just about word process at the time. So I'd already been teaching for two or three years at that point, um, but I wasn't very good with computers at all. So by getting my own uh, machine and also the uh, the ICT coordinator in my school, the middle school that I talked about, was really, really lovely and very, um, very helpful and sort of showed me the way in which I could, um, for example, um, get around the basics of how how to use a computer. So I remember there was one famous day, I've, I've, I've talked about this before on other podcasts, but there was a famous day whereby he looked at my, my desktop and he said, um, do you know how to make folders, Joe? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you basically got all these files open on your desktop. What you could do is make folders and then drag and drop them all into those folders and get everything organized, a bit like a filing cabinet. It's almost like you know, you've opened this filing cabinet uh, up and everything's a mess and actually you can get everything organized and uh, and filed. And 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 that's sort of one of those moments, certainly in yeah. you know, my life. And I was able to get everything organized and, and blah, blah, blah. But uh, the, the point I'm making here is that really because of the fact I had this this interest, which had been sparked by um, uh, looking at different websites like uh, bonjour.org.uk, which um, is now Linguascope. Um, which was using things like uh, hot potato activities uh, based mm. on the the multimedia suite you could download from a uh, university in Canada. Um, it has been around for many, many years, and I got really excited about seeing that and thinking that would be really useful in my mm. which classrooms. And then from there, um, being really, really independent and and passionate, and you know, if you if you're motivated to learn something, nothing can hold you back, really. I think anyway. So I had a bit of support. As I said, from my from my colleague, but really it was the the driving force was behind my own interest and and looking up things on the internet and working how to do whatever it is that I needed to do, and I then just mm. I then just worked from there, and then um, I was lucky enough to um, have the opportunity to do a little bit of training back in two thousand and four. Um, uh, a friend of mine is who's no longer around, unfortunately, uh, Graham Davis, who uh, created this incredible. Uh, directory of resources around uh, call uh, that you referred to earlier on and we sort of became um, online friends we did meet uh, face to face a couple of times while he was still alive but um, because of our shared passion um, he was um, very very kind towards me and he um, was double booked on a session that he'd been asked to do by a school and then uh, he said um, that he suggested to the school that they could invite me to do it instead which is what happened I did that and I got a real taste for Brilliant. training people on how they could use technology in languages. And then 2005 was when it really sort of took off. And I um, I spoke at, an, at a, the Linguiscope conference in Colchester and there was <clears throat> there was a lady there, Sue Barmer, who at the time was the, the languages lead for the Specialist Schools and Academies Trust. And she suggested that I apply to be a lead practitioner, which I did. And I was successful in doing that. And I did that for three years. And as part of that, um, I organized three different events at my school, which I refer to as the Isle of Wight Conference. And those uh, events were all about language and technology. And I invited people from uh, around the UK, including from uh, a couple of different people from Scotland who came down. And we we had a range of, um, uh, of audiences. We normally had between sort of 60 and 70 people that would come along. And, and then in sort of 2006, that's when obviously when uh, Twitter started. I joined up in 2007, so it was around the same time. And then it was really sort of 2008 um, when my friend Drew Buddy, uh, who's who's um, digital maverick on Twitter, he um, came down because I'd asked him to give a session around Moodle and languages, and he was really encouraging everybody to sign up to Twitter and to tweet during the sessions. And I know this sounds sort of commonplace now, but the idea that you could be in a session and you could be following someone else's uh, tweets who was in another session at the time felt absolutely groundbreaking. It's felt absolutely yeah. amazing, this idea of a back channel, as one says. And um, yeah, I, I would really put a lot of that initial um, interest 
that that drew really fired up in people was really instrumental in sort of the the beginnings if you like of the mfl twitterati and then it just really mm. went from there and just mushroomed and now we have this fantastic community that are sharing ideas literally on a daily basis and thank goodness particularly during the pandemic that we were able to come together and to share ideas and do do webinars i i've also organized um over 140 webinars referred to as tilt which stands for uh, uh, technology language teaching with the association for language learning and that was uh, an amazing thing to do to, to to start and to put together and to ask people from literally all over the world to present about uh, different topics such as remote teaching hybrid teaching etc so there's been a lot going on and it's difficult to to summarize that in a short period of time but hopefully that's yeah. a snapshot of where my sort of interest came but as i said already I was a languages teacher first and foremost, who then developed an interest in technology. And because I had that interest and that passion, if you like, slash yeah. obsession, um, I was able to um, I was able to really push on and to become the expert, I suppose, as ChatGPT said, that I am now. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I mean, you touched on some really interesting points there, uh, and uh, especially after the pandemic. Uh, I think the pandemic was like a, a big pushing point for many of us as as teachers to sort of engage perhaps more actively with with technology for the obvious reason that we were the, the medium through which we were doing our lessons was through technology. So my, my question is, what does tech in the language classroom look like now nowadays? And do you feel that teachers' digital literacy, if you will, has increased uh, because of the pandemic? Right. I'll do the second point first. I think digital yeah. literacy has definitely improved as a result of the pandemic. I remember mm -hmm. uh, using a quote from a principal in a school in Rome, a British international school in Rome, um, around March 2020. So just at the beginning, saying that he was hoping that um, as a result of the pandemic, um, that the staff that were maybe reluctant users of technology or, or didn't have the time or were not interested for whatever reason, would have their horizons raised because mm. of uh, the fact that they had to use the technology, they had to do this emergency remote teaching that everyone was thrown into doing uh, in the early uh, months of the pandemic. And I think that's a really true statement. And I think that's really resonated with me. It resonated with me at the time. and It's carried on resonating with me because I think that one of the silver linings of the, the pandemic, um, which obviously was absolutely terrible and awful for, for many, mm. many reasons, that the um, the teachers who maybe for whatever reason were um, not particularly fans of educational technology because they had to use it, um, raised their awareness of what it could do and maybe changed their perspectives as a result of that. So I think that's a really positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, in relation to what does it look like in the classroom, I think that one way of being able to get a good idea of what it looks like in the classroom is to go onto Twitter and to search for the hashtag MFL Twitterati, or um, more recently, I've really got into this idea of um, Twitter search operators, which I know this sounds a bit geeky, but bear with me. So <laughs> if you go into um, the advanced Twitter search, you can see that you can do things like you can search under date, you can search under uh, keywords, you can, you can do various advanced searches, but there's also a whole set of like little codes that you can use, which yeah. allow you to um do your to make your searches more granular so i've been all over this i've been really excited about and it's really helped me in getting the good stuff that i want more quickly than using um just a random search as it were so what i would suggest if people want to see what technology looks like in the languages classroom that they either use the hashtag mfl twitterati or um for the mfl twitterers list that i talked about uh, each list has its own number um, so what you do is you put in list colon and then the number for that particular list off the top of my head. I'm, I'm, I can't remember what it is, but I can, I'm sure I can find it out for people if we want to put that in the show notes. But basically, you could put in list colon, then the number, which is about six or seven figures. And then you could put in something else such as filter colon media. And then that will bring up any uh, images which have been included within anybody who's part of that list over uh, over a period of time it could be you can put in dates as well you can put in from colon the year dash the month dash the date or you can put in until 
colon, and then the same. Um, but if you were, for example, to put in uh, list colon, the number, filter colon media, and then maybe a keyword like the name of a tool, like, I don't know, quizzes or look it or, um, uh, or, uh, or flip, uh, that sort of thing, you would be able to see very quickly some images of how teachers and students are using these particular tools in the classroom. If you were sort of asking me to to give a like a snapshot of of my impressions of what it looks like as well, obviously you're going to have presumably some sort of uh, data projector nowadays and some sort of uh, ability to uh, share your screen. You might see some mobile devices as well. You might see Chromebooks. Um, you might see a bring your own device context. You might just see a TV screen and then the student sitting at their desk. You know, you're going to have a whole range of different. Uh, situations that you're going to see and i think again the pandemic highlighted the digital disparity between some schools that had all the kit let's say and some schools yeah. that absolutely didn't and uh my heart went out to those schools that you know they didn't have the kit they, the the students couldn't afford to have um their own laptop or didn't have a mobile device or couldn't use the data on their mobile device or maybe there was a there was a one laptop in the household um, but the, the uh, one of the parents or a parent was using that to work from, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that was another stark reality of what happened um, in the pandemic. But I think that by by doing a search on Twitter, you can get a really good idea of what it looks like. Um, but the great thing about the MFL Twitterati is by uh, the fact that if you do go there, say, every day for, say, 10 minutes or so or or longer, uh, you do say follow that uh, that list that I've talked about. You can get a pretty good idea of what right. technology looks like, or or what the MFL Twitter art is all about, um, by by reading those tweets. And yeah. if you do that regularly, it's almost like a this sort of like drip drip effect, and it's very very useful. And you can you can get a good idea pretty quickly on what are the uh, you know the cream of the crop, as it were. In other words. Yeah you'll see the same tools being mentioned again and again and again. So at the moment, a lot of uh, content and a lot of things I've been sharing personally have been to do with ChatGPT because that's what the, yeah. the audience seems to be really interested in. So I'm basically sort of feeding the audience with content, which I think is going to be useful. But um, when you uh, ask a question like, for example, uh, what would be a good uh, set of tools for uh, practicing listening skills and then you get lots of answers coming in and and for example recently i was doing a session for the british council and um i like to do these sort of clinic sessions that i call them from time to time which is i put together a google form and then i ask people to ask me questions in that google form about a week before the webinar and then once i've got all those answers i will then uh, put together a presentation based on the questions that people have asked. So mm -hmm. one question that came up was, how do you uh, use technology to promote listening skills? So I asked the MFL Twitterati that question, and I got all these fantastic responses through, and then I made a compilation of all the answers that came in and divided them between the tools which are free and then the tools which you have to pay for, which is always, always a big um, hurdle for lots of schools because there are lots of schools that essentially don't pay for anything at all. And by doing that, by having that community at your fingertips, literally, it means that you can draw on everyone's expertise and everyone can share and contribute together. And it's a really democratic thing. And if you're good at what you do, then your voice gets louder and louder and louder. And I think as long as everyone is kind to each other and is respectful, then um, nothing can hold us back. And, and that's been the yep. case for years and years and years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. I mean, you've touched on very many, uh, loads of interesting points there. Um, especially there was quite an interesting point about the sort of the disparity between, you know, schools or or individuals or learners even who couldn't access um, the types of technology that were kind of necessary to continue the education, um, be it within language learning or or not um, through the pandemic. Um, I have a question though regarding the use of technology in general. Um, is there a danger nowadays? Like I, I work in teacher education, so I'm observing teachers, I'm working with a lot of teachers. And it seems like teachers now almost feel like they need to use tech. Like there is, there's a need to, to always use tech. And my, my question is, is there a danger of using 
educational technology for the sake of using educational technology? Yeah. So that is, yeah, that's a key question. And I, you know, I would be lying to say that um, there are some times which I use the te- I use technology when I am, say, presenting because I just want to have a play with it and experiment with it. But I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think that mm. first and foremost, um, what teachers need to be thinking about always, which is, a, is an obvious thing, is always about the pedagogy and why they're using technology mm. and what does the technology bring to the table? How does it enhance what they're trying to do, pedagogically speaking? And if it isn't enhancing it, if it's sort of like the 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 level one of the uh, the summer model which refers to uh, substitution if they're basically um getting their students to write up their their bit of text from their exercise book into a word document then that's essentially the same thing that would be the substitution level whereas if they are using the technology maybe to uh, collaborate with another uh, student so if they're using say a google doc and they're they're working on a on a document together then that would be the next level up that would be um uh, modification and then um from there they could then the teacher could then redesign the task and to think differently about it maybe use a more multimodal approach to it maybe incorporate some uh, some audio ask the students to uh, record their voice uh, creating a presentation or recording a screencast or they could give some uh, the teacher could give some audio feedback for example so it's more of a multimodal okay. approach which would be more like um um uh, which would be more like augmentation. And then the final one would be redefinition. That would be when you completely redefine the task and maybe inv- involve um, a, a real audience. So maybe you were connecting with a, a partner school in another country and you were doing some sort of um, uh, statistical work with your, your other school and then presenting that and collaborating together. That would be more like a redefinition level. So I think that the summon model I found, I mean, it's quite a blunt tool, but I think it's a useful way of helping teachers to consider always about when they're implementing technology in the classroom. But first and foremost, it should be all about the the pedagogy. That said, I do think that there are some uh, tools maybe that are very motivational. For example, Blook It, right. um, tools that allow you, for example, to uh, steal gold from your other colleagues in the class you can imagine that would be that would go down really well or kahoot but at the same time uh these tools can be overused and if it's just about the motivation then that motivation will wane over time so what's important i think is to um to try and make sure that the technology is not an add-on but embedded within the uh the scheme of uh, of learning and is used in a very uh pedagogically sound and purposeful way if you're doing that, then I think that that will um, it will really help and enhance what's happening in the classroom. But if, but first uh, but first and foremost, it's how the students react to the use of technology. Yeah. So it might be, for example, that, that there are some students who are not maybe as into language learning as say you are, but the technology mm-hmm. is a little hook to bring them in. Or it might be that you get one student who's incredibly keen and just can't get enough of the uh of the subject and so you can suggest uh, ways in which they can be independent at home and and encourage their student agency and their their autonomy by getting them to do activities let's say assignments and this sort of thing through um quizzes or or book it etc so they can they can work and they can revise as much as possible which i think is wonderful um obviously there's always been say libraries in the past but what's different i think about the technology and the online web tools and the way in which um, you can go on streaks and the algorithm can work out what you need to to work on and send you reminders. I think that's absolutely fabulous and a very sort of 21st century, if you like, way of doing these sorts of things. So that the, 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 the pedagogy, the pillars of what we've been doing for years and years and years are still there. You know, the importance of feedback, the importance of um, uh, of teaching vocabulary, of teaching grammar, et cetera. But the technology, I think, brings that up and, and enhances it and makes it more appealing maybe to young people who are going to be going into the workplace anywhere anyway whereby they're going to have to need to have these digital skills so i think that the idea of um, just ignoring technology completely is is a non-starter i know there are some schools that are very proud of the fact that they that they ban mobile phones and all the rest of it and i and i get that i do understand that but i think that um the, the well, Ofsted have said in the past that 
the schools that that manage the the use of mobile devices or digital technology in general better are the ones which have more of a trusting relationship with the students and build yep. this positive learning uh, environment whereby they make it very clear they give clear guidelines on when the technology is appropriate and when it's not appropriate and i think personally i know this is quite a, a hot topic but i think personally i think that's the way forward rather than just banning mobile phones across the board i mean i do appreciate there are issues around students recording uh, in class without permission and things like that and obviously that's a really important issue um, and there was just some schools that can't afford, for example, to get a, a class set of iPads or Chromebooks or what have you. So that could be right. a solution. But at the same time, if you're allowing students to bring their own devices in, they might be doing other things instead of doing the work. And clearly that's an issue. But if the teacher is walking around and and seeing what the students are doing, then they have to take responsibility at the same time of um, uh, of making sure that the students are on task. I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do. But I think the idea of just banning um, uh, the use of mobile devices or now, there are lots and lots of places all over the world which are banning ChatGPT as well. For example, Italy recently have banned it across the country. Yeah. Um, I think that sh that throws up other questions as well about what we allow and what we don't allow um, yeah. to be used. Uh, and obviously, a caveat as well, with ChatGPT, you have to be 18 or above, well, it was that you had to be 18 or above to create a this like contract with OpenAI. They've now changed that. So you have to be 13 or above, but have parental permission. But then, of course, the school would have to ensure they had parental permission and the fact that you have to put in a mobile phone number in order to um, to create an account as well. So I think personally, the way I'm advocating the use of ChatGPT is to encourage uh, teachers to think about using it as a way of doing the heavy lifting and producing resources much, much more quickly and easily than maybe they could do uh, normally. Not to say they would just use them off the shelf, but maybe they can tweak the production of what uh, ChatGPT has come up with and with a teacher's eye, with, a, with their professional teacher's eye, tweak it to make sure it absolutely fits the needs and the um, abilities of the students in front of them for that particular lesson. But it is amazing, and I'm learning about new things every day and what it can do yeah. for yeah, you. That's. I really love what you said about um, the idea of technology being embedded. It's not just a, an extra thing. And I, I, I do, I do agree with you. Um, technology is in in our children's lives, in everyone's lives at the moment, and and simply disregard it, I think, is doing them a disservice. Um, and and you mentioned about the capabilities of ChatGPT, and so that's it's kind of. Um, there are all these extra resources, and if we learn to use them appropriately, then they can be quite powerful in a sense. Um, and you've touched on the, probably the the point that when people listen to this, they're going to be like, "I wanted, I wanted to listen to about ChatGPT." Um, and I suppose that, that brings us to a, a very interesting question about the future. And I know before we before we um, before this uh, this 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 podcast, this video, we we spoke about speaking about the future. And how you're a bit a bit hesitant to to predict or make predictions about the future because maybe the future is already here, or, right? So I'm going to ask you the question, and maybe we can go a little bit further into your thoughts about that. And so, uh, with languages or with language teaching anyway, um, and the future of language teaching and 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 ed tech, are there some things that we can say about the future that we're sure about or not sure about? um and I'm, I'm treading carefully here okay um so to start off with i always think um it's a bit foolhardy to to try and predict the future because nobody really knows apart from those hmm. companies those huge companies with huge budgets who maybe have been um looking at and experimenting with and gestating amazing tools which have been maybe in gest gestation for say 10 years and then we're only going to hear about them when they're ready to release them to the market. That's why I'm I'm hesitant about trying to predict the future. But that said, having been in this uh, in this particular environment for, say, over 20 years, I can say hand on heart that really the pedagogy hasn't, hasn't really changed at all. This idea that we want uh, the students to collaborate, we want the students to be creative, we want them to be good communicators, um, we want them to be able to use critical thinking skills, all those sorts of pillars or mm very, very fundamental, important aspects of learning and education based on 
you know, cognitive science and this idea of, you know, retrieval practice and interleaving and, and, and what have you, I think those are very strong and solid. And I think what's happened in recent years, in let's say the last 20 years, is the technology has got better and better and better and quicker and quicker and quicker. Mm. And I think what's been very exciting since the end of November 2022 is that ChatGPT and ChatGPT technology in the um, ChatGPT 3.5, I think it is, that people have been incorporating within their own uh, tools and there's been a whole there's been a whole myriad of different ai tools that are coming out you know supposedly hundreds every day which um i'm sort of like a fire hose essentially i'm sort of because of um the fact that i'm looking at lots of facebook groups and on twitter and, and what have you i get a an impression or the cream of the crop i was talking about earlier about the ones which a lot of people are talking about mm. the sorts of things which are out there but i think that why it's so exciting the reason i personally have got very excited about this is because it does feel like a a bit of a paradigm shift in the way that it's going to make the lives of teachers better i think because it's going to address um in a very concrete way the work-life balance the way in which it can produce resources so much more quickly than could be done um manually um by by humans by tired teachers on a friday night or whatever it might be um or when you're you're desperately looking for an idea and it's going to be able to produce a really really good starting point <clears throat> i'm not saying that you would use the um the content straight off the bat but personally what i've been using it for is i've been asking it some questions and then that's been really useful for being inspired on the direction to go in relation to say a presentation i'm i'm putting together or yeah questions that I may have and I think that's the way to go and I mean literally this morning um I uh, I woke up opened my iPad saw on a Facebook group there was a teacher in Australia who had um shown some examples about how they're using uh, chat GPT she's a primary school teacher and she had decided to create a um a Facebook group just looking at chat GPT uh, aimed at Australian teachers, and literally in three hours, it had two thousand members. I mean, if that doesn't mm. show the interest in this particular area, I don't know what does. And I think there were about two hundred and fifteen comments on that one post that she had done. And I just, you know, spent some time going through all the comments, you know, nodding along and this sort of thing, going, "Oh, that's interesting." And she was doing things like um, uh, she was putting the Australian um, uh, New South Wales uh, curriculum into or, or so, so the mark scheme into uh chat gpt and then getting it to generate 30 lessons based on that wow. uh, that criteria as it were and she was saying you can also get it to to mark uh the work of the students to give feedback and all and, and what have you and again i wouldn't say that you just take it as it is you'd have to tweak things but what an amazing time saver so i think that as you sort of alluded to earlier the future is now the future is ai or one of the futures is, is ai and um at the moment the the people interested in, in ed tech are all over this and are, and are pushing the boundaries and seeing what can be done and what can't be done yeah. me included and um, i'm getting very very excited about it for example in relation to languages um we uh, did a tilt webinar so as i said earlier the technology language teaching webinar series with um a, a, a lovely amazing teacher called uh, julia morris who's a languages teacher from the southwest of england and she had been very keen to put together a presentation this was a month ago now and there were other people as well who wanted to present about chat gpt and was sort of direct messaging me saying i'd really love to share my thoughts on this so what we did was we did an hour with julia and then we did nine um five minute presentations from the various people who wanted to to take part and mm. we recorded the whole thing and that uh the last time i checked has had over eight, 800 views so it just again shows that people are have a huge appetite at the moment about um this particular tool i've also presented for uh two organizations in australia the modern language teacher association of new south wales and the modern language teacher association of victoria um about chat gpt the first one had 70 people watching live. The second one had 130 people watching live. And um, I've also been approached by giving, you know, keynotes and, and what have you for the, the German Teacher Association in South Australia. I've been asked to do a keynote about ChatGPT and, and so on and so forth. So at the moment, it seems very much that this is 
um, one of the areas of huge interest. And as with anything to do with early adoption, people are are, are all over it, are, are sharing ideas. And as a result of that, you get a pretty good idea pretty quickly on the things that it can do. But as I have the personality that I do, I'm always trying to look at ways in which that can be pushed to the next level. For example, yep. um, I was having a play with it in relation to uh, Google Maps. And <clears throat> um, what uh, what normally happens is I, I see a tweet about a certain idea and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to have to follow that thread. And that's what that's my life, really. So anyway, about Google Maps, what you can do is you can get ChatGPT to generate a table. That's really, really easy. So you just ask it to generate a table and then you ask it to say, put in um, five places which are well known in Paris, like five monuments or five buildings, for example. And then in the second um, column, you put in a description about each place. And then you could then uh, ask it to generate questions around those descriptions and put in an answer key. And then what you can do is you can take that table and paste it into a Google Sheet and then you can go to uh, Google My Maps, which is the, the lot more personalized version of Google Maps, which means you right. can actually create your own customized map, which is what I did. And uh, it asks you to import, or it, you can import a map from Google Sheets, which is what I did. It did that, and then lo and behold, it had populated an area of Paris with the five monuments that ChatGPT generated, and it it had included the um, the descriptions as part of the description on the uh, on the map as well. So essentially, yeah. what you could do is you could take that Google My Maps, you could embed it into something else, such as um, Book Creator, for example. Add in the questions, maybe create a Google form if you wanted to, to get the students to um, answer the questions there, and then and then you've got the answer key as well. That would be one example. And then from there, I thought, I wonder if it could do the same thing with Google Earth. So I worked out that with Google Earth, you can um, you can create what's called a KML file, which is the, um, the 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 native format that you need to import into Google Earth. So again, I said, could you um, generate a um, a table in KML format that will um, allow me to uh, generate a Google Earth project, which is what it did. I then copied that um, uh, into uh, uh, TextPad. Um, uh, sorry, I copied that into Text Edit on my Mac. But if I was using uh, a Windows machine, I could have put it into Notepad, right. pasted in that um, that code, as it were. And then what you do is you save that as, instead of a .txt file, as a .kml file so that Google yeah. Earth can recognize it. And then you just go to Google Earth, go to the Projects option, and you can import the KML file from there. And lo and behold, I had um, the Google Earth in Dublin, and I had the the the, the different labels there. And I was able to go to, say, Google Street View and see what it was actually like at that particular label and then sort of jump from label to label. So let's say in a languages classroom, you could generate for that for the students. Um, you could then ask them to use some sort of screencasting software like Loom or Screencastify yeah. to record their screen. So to give a voiceover, have the text in the target language and then create some comprehension questions based on that. So those are a few ways in which um you can sort of push the boundaries as opposed to just asking chat gpt a question and getting answers um if i'm allowed just one more example which is sort of pushing yeah. the envelope. there's a there's a website which i've come across called term board which is t-e-r-m-b-o-a-r-d and that allows you to use chat gpt it's actually built within it to create mind maps so i put in um the prompt it's all about prompt engineering and writing a good prompt so i put in a prompt about, okay, I want you to create a mind map to help me to plan a trip to Paris. I'm always using, I don't know why, but I'm always using Paris. At the or moment. is it with Paris? <laughs> to plan um, a trip to Paris um, for different budgets. Um, you need to think about transport, uh, accommodation, things to do while you're there and what have you. And it did that. It coped really well with it. And within a matter of seconds, it had created this mind map for me, which you could then uh, export as a as an image file, and I was thinking you could then put that into something else, and then create some questions like, you know, imagine you've got five hundred euros and you want to go to Paris for the weekend, or you've got a thousand euros and you want to go to Paris for the weekend. Write a text based on the mind map of what you have decided to do in in French, let's say, or whichever language you wanted to do, and you could replicate that same idea easily oh. for 
for any language. And yeah, so I'm I'm thinking of uh, at the moment, I'm thinking one of the things I need to do is put together a course <laughs> whereby I can either do that live synchronously and show people this sort of thing, or like Nick Peachy has done, create an asynchronous version whereby people will then sign up and, and go through different videos. But in a way, I don't know about you, but I like the live. I like doing things live. And so yeah. the idea of actually showing people and seeing them going, wow, like that, or Another example of that, actually, in the Austra- one of the Australian ones I did recently, I showed how you can uh, get ChatGPT to generate um, an outline whereby you choose that all the uh, all the titles, all the headings are in heading one, and all the bullet points are in heading two. So I literally asked it to create an outline PowerPoint uh, presentation, a Word no? document, which it did, um, based on the, that formatting. I copied and pasted that text from ChatGPT into Word, and then there's an option to export that to a PowerPoint, which is what I did. And then uh, within PowerPoint, you have this PowerPoint designer. So it looks at the text, and it then creates images based on the text. So literally within 30 seconds, I would say, um, well, maybe a bit, maybe a minute or so, having created the format, it had then created six or seven slides with um embedded images based on the text in those slides and again you'd have to tweak it a little bit but there, there, there you have it you have a, a presentation based on what chat gpt has generated and then if you wanted to put that into google slides you could upload that powerpoint into say google drive and then just open it in a google slides presentation because you can't do the same thing it doesn't have the same outline option mm. in google slides that can be done as quickly as you can um using microsoft tools so that's another another idea on how you can really push um the limits of ChatGPT, but this is changing on a daily basis and it's getting yeah. better and better and better and the more it learns on what humans want the better it will be uh, able to give the sorts of outputs that people are looking for which is just amazing this is uh i mean there's a lot in there isn't there um and i like what you mentioned about the the reducing the workload of teachers um because a lot of that you know used to be done manually where you'd have to go find the information you have to put into a word document have to cut all this stuff out and then you have to put everything together um and so again perhaps then it's you know if we're thinking about the teacher education aspect it's it's bringing this idea of uh you i think you called it prompt engineering which is quite a nice term um working out how to work with AI for these sorts of things, which is quite interesting. Um, so we get to now to sort of the advice section of, of the chat. For those teachers that are looking to be more, let's call it tech friendly, um, in their classrooms or within their planning processes, as, you, as you've mentioned, um, what pieces of advice would you give them? And I suppose we could probably say one of them already would be to to work out how to use these prompts then i'm guessing yeah so in, i mean in relation to prompts in particular um again through seeing what other people are tweeting about or writing about etc it right. seems that um it's very important for example to uh be specific in your prompt so the more specific you can be uh the better so instead of saying write me an essay about this particular topic uh, if you are more specific, so you say, for example, who the audience is going to be or um, the age of the students and this sort of thing, or um, maybe some prior learning, how much they've been learning about this topic already, uh, this, this sort of thing. So in other words, the more information you give ChatGPT, the better it can be. Yeah. If you want to get it to play the role of a particular character, that's really, really useful as well. So you could say, OK, I want you to imagine that you are um, a waiter in a restaurant uh, in Spain, and I want to um, come in, and I'm a, uh, a person who's learning uh, Spanish. I'm a native English speaker, and I'd like to have a conversation with you. Um, can you can you help out? Can you play the role of the waiter? And ChatGPT is absolutely brilliant for those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also say in the mood of. So you could say, for example, um, I would like you to make the the text that you're going to produce funny or scary or serious or whatever it might be, those sorts of things, you can um, aim it at a particular uh, CEFR level. So you could say, I'd like you to design an activity um, based on uh, the CEFR um, aimed at a B1 level student, for example, on this particular topic, those sorts of things, which are really helpful. And I think lots of people don't realize 
that you can actually be as granular mm. as that. Um, I think that um, being aware of the fact that sometimes ChatGPT uh, says something very confidently, but it's actually completely made up. <laughs> so you have to be very <laughs> wary of that as well. It actually says that when you originally um, sign up, that it may not um, always be accurate. So I I remember Julia Morris talking about the difference between Google and ChatGPT, and she, she was suggesting that for facts, use Google, but for creating text and this sort of thing, use ChatGPT. And I would agree with that. So it's almost as if you would go to uh, to chat GPT if you wanted to maybe input some information you found from Google, but then get it to create um, some resources or some activities based on mm. that. I think that's really exciting. Um, so I think that the, the 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 prompt engineering that you have to consider is is essential. And but that said, that what I've tended what I've tended to do is I tended to ask it a question a little bit like when we were sort of joking at the beginning about when I said you know who is Joe Dale you know you put in a question and then based yeah. on the way that chat gbt responds to that you then tweak it or you could say oh could you summarize that or could you make that simpler or could you um make the the, the language uh, more demanding or uh, for example you could um uh, put in some text and get chat gbt to give you feedback or maybe you could say okay i'm i'm looking at this particular topic on the perfect tense in french aimed at um uh, a class of 14 year olds um could you design uh, a gap fill based on um that particular topic and then see what yeah. it comes up with in relation to gap fills i found it's not been consistent so sometimes when you say create a gap fill or create a fill in the blanks activity or create a close exercise sometimes it will give you let's say um it will give you the gaps which are underlined sometimes it will give you dashes a number and a dash uh, sometimes it will give you, say, three or four possible answers with dashes in between, and you have to choose the right one. It's not consistent in that way. What what some people advise is that you create a chat, and once you've got it in the format that you want, you then always go back to that same chat. But if you're using this regularly, you might not be able to find that chat, and there isn't a search option in that chat, uh, in ChatGPT, I mean, to then find when you've originally talked about something. So that's interesting as well. But um, this idea of always, um, you know, fact checking or always making sure that what it has produced is is accurate and correct, I think that that's really important. And to um, uh, to, to 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 change things around to to make them more bespoke based on your based on your needs. So those are those are a few ideas. But I mean, uh, just off top of as well as well in relation to gap fills. I mean, what I would suggest is get ChatGPT to create your text once you're happy with the content of the text copy that and put it into something else such as um mm. learningapps.org for example as a really very nice closed test um uh, activity so you basically put the text in and then you go to the gaps that you want or the, the words that you want to turn into gaps and simply replace them with dash the number dash um so it'd be dash one dash the next one would be dash two dash etc um, and then you have then have to put the correct answers in learning out. So it takes a little bit longer, but then you can have complete control over yep. um, how it how it deals with the gaps. And then there's um there's also a Google Doc um, extension called uh, Close It, which is C L O Z E I T one word, and that allows you to input the text. And then you literally um, can highlight one word, and you can use the highlighter tool to change it to say yellow, whatever it might be. And then what I would recommend is once you've got it highlighted to double click on the format paint, a little paintbrush icon um, in Google Docs. So you get the same one in Word as well. And then you just double click on that. It then copies the formatting to the clipboard and then you can go through and just double click on any of the words you want to turn into gaps. Then you then run, close it, and it will then remove all of those, replace them with an underlined gap and put all the keywords that you've taken out um, underneath, um, underneath the text. So and likewise with WordWall, you can also input the text into WordWall into the close activity and just quickly change the words that you want to remove with gaps. And it does it very quickly. So I, I found that, that, that ChatGPT has been inconsistent with gap filling. Some people have said, no, no, it works fine with me. But I personally, having done this a lot, I found that it's inconsistent. So it's best, I think, in my opinion, just to create the text and then use another tool to actually generate yep. 
gap fill. There are other other activities which it does brilliantly, but I think gap fills is not its strong point, in, as far as I'm uh, as far as I'm aware. Anyway, brilliant. Yeah. No. Well, thank you for that. Um, people just need to play around with it. I think. Um, I and, yeah. and, and 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 ask and other a... people. And um, I put together a wakelet as well, which has got um, over four hundred resources and and youtube clips and things like that which i've collected together looking at chat and particularly in relation to language education some of the ideas are not specific to language education but lots of them are i would say that would be a really good starting point and i would say in general to subscribe to the mfl twitterers list that has over 2800 i think subscribers now and to look at my youtube channel which is available at jodel 100 or or at jodel because you can now have a username for your for your youtube channel so i, I jumped on that um before any other jodel did which um which is cool and um that'd be another great uh, place to look and just in general to uh, to ask on twitter or to on to uh, to ask on facebook groups uh, when people are talking about chat gpt and just see yeah see how you get on so i would encourage people to to jump in and have a go but also uh, to learn from others as well, because this is a, this is an, an ever moving feast, and we're all learning yeah. together. Um, well, we get to the the last section of the of the chat, which is always my favourite, um, and we talk about book recommendations. Um, so, do you have one or two book recommendations for those that, um, or, or anything interesting on on educational technology, really? Uh, and if it's with a foreign language focus, even better. Well, um, so I'm not a huge reader of books. I must say, I, I tend to uh, do a lot of reading. I, I read uh, blog posts and Twitter, et cetera. Mm. But I have noticed that there's um, a couple of new books um, about AI, which um, I'm sure that people would find very interesting. There's a book by uh, Dan Fitzpatrick, who's been appearing here, there and everywhere on um, on uh, Breakfast TV and other places uh, who is a teacher? He's one of the people behind the uh, Edu Furist uh, Edu Furist uh, podcast and Edu Furist um, uh, group, and he has written a, a book called The AI Classroom, which I haven't read personally, but I know that um, people seem to be really liking. And there's a bit of a sort of a competition at the moment about when people have ordered it. They've they've been taking selfies um, with it, um, uh, posting on on the Facebook group, which is uh, pretty cool. And his newsletter, I think, has about two or three thousand um, uh, recipients. Every time you post uh, something about AI, because it's such a hot topic, that um, a couple of thousand people are receiving that in their inbox. Right. So I think that would be a good one to recommend. As I said, I haven't read it personally, but it seems to be uh, it seems to be very good. And another one from a friend of mine, um, Darren White, um, who again is a big fan of edu educational technology. He's also a Spanish teacher as well. And he's done various uh, uh, webinars with me over uh, the last couple of years in for tilt webinars and other other webinars as well. And he's got a new book out called um, uh, "What's Your Why?" Um, I think it is, if I remember correctly. Um, so that's easy to find on Amazon. Darren White um, and uh, also Matt Miller, who's also a former Spanish teacher as well. Uh, he has produced an AI book, which you would be able to find. Um, by looking at his website called um, Ditch That Textbook. So I can't remember the exact title, but it has AI in the title. And he's done lots of very interesting webinars recently about AI. And um, one of the things which I found particularly interesting about what he said was this idea of having a continuum about how students are using AI in the sense that, in the sense that um, if they are only using AI and they're not doing any thinking about the uh, the text they're asking AI to produce or ChatGPT to produce, then would that be regarded as cheating? Um, but at the other end, um, you'd have a student that wasn't using AI at all and was just doing all their own work. Would that be, as you said earlier, you know, like a missed opportunity, as it were? Or is there that element between, which is sort of in the way where my thinking is of using the AI to get you thinking and to change your um, your ideas or put you in a certain direction and then do your different iterations and then asking it more information or saying, I really like this paragraph, could you change, but can you change this little bit about it or could you give me a title based on the text that you produce, that sort of thing, that you're using the AI in a very purposeful way. Um, to me, that's a really good, honest um, uh, conversation to have about yeah. Do uh, are we are we just going to say that um, 
that students shouldn't be using AI at all. I don't think we're, we're naive enough to think that they won't be using it because I'm sure they will be using it. So how, as right. institutions, do we consider um, if it's cheating uh, based on the the, the the use or the um, the percentage of use that that uh, a student has used the AI with if they're just using it and they're not thinking about it a bit like Google Translate and it's the level of the language that it produces far higher than what we know as teachers that that particular student can produce then obviously we need to have a conversation with that student about that um, yeah. and as well as we consider how we do assessments maybe going uh, back to uh, uh, pen and paper or maybe considering doing um, audio presentations whereby they don't have access to a mobile device they don't have access to chat gpt and seeing yeah. if they can produce the same level of of uh, of content that they produce in their written work those sorts of things i think uh, which i think is a very healthy conversation and the way in which we can um yeah. reconsider how we do assessments and how the effect of chat gpt which is not going to be going away now um even if countries may ban it as it were the the, the genie is out of the bottle and it's just how schools adapt to it and pivot based on what we know it can do. And it's just going to get better and better and better. Definitely. I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, and now I have plenty of, of, of new reading. Um, I'm a big reader, um, but uh, I, I must admit reading about AI is something that I, that I usually generally do in, in blogs and things. So uh, picking up one of these books, I think will be uh, quite worthwhile for the teachers that are looking to really, really experiment with it. And those questions that you have are healthy questions and we, and we're going to need to have them, you know, as with everything in education, there's always a pushback when something's new. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how, how things go over the next five to 10 years. Um, Joe, I want to say thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, it's been really insightful. My, my head is hurting with all the ideas, um, all the information. Um, and, uh, I do look forward to hopefully speaking with you again in the future. I would absolutely love to do that. I think that it's, uh, it's always great fun to have a conversation with someone uh, like yourself on a podcast whereby you can almost like crystallize your ideas by talking it through with another human being. And you can work out what you really think about a certain topic. And I think that's a really healthy thing to do, a little bit like blogging as well, the way in which you can really summarize your thoughts and have time to think about them carefully. Likewise, with a with a podcast, the way in which you can be you know, asked different questions, you don't really know what the question is going to be. And then you can just give your thoughts. And as a result of the that pressure, I suppose, of trying to be as eloquent <laughs> and as articulate as possible, that you really get down to the essence of what you think about a particular topic. And, you know, um, clearly in the last few months, I've been been watching and listening to and reading lots and lots of information about ChatGPT and AI. And I suppose this is my sort of um, regurgitated version of all those different influences. Uh, and that's why, again, I've tried to name check as many people as possible, um, because I think that's really important as well, that you don't sort of pass mm. things off as, as your own if, if essentially it's your uh, reiterating what someone else has said. But I think that um, there's such an interest at the moment and there's such a lot of um, discussion around this that I think that um, it, it's certainly going to be the future in the next uh, the next wee while. And who knows what yes. will be down the uh, uh, coming down the road um, after that. Um, just the people at Google and Microsoft probably will know or, or other places. But um, at the moment, we just have to react to what then comes up on our radar and respond to that. But it is a very exciting time. I don't view it as... Uh, something which is very, very negative. Obviously, it can be AI could be used in nefarious ways, which is very, very scary. But in education and for teachers saving time and for getting more sort of headspace and release more creativity, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And hopefully uh, many, many more teachers will grasp the nettle and see what it can do moving forwards as well. 100%. Cheers, Joe. Take care. Thanks. Okay, I think that was...